a community person at Red Hat for over a decade. I've been doing open source for two decades, and I have learned some things. Um, I have seen attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion and all other quotes appropriately. Um, however, I do not want to stand here today and tell you my experiences, because there is more than enough of that going on in community work as it is. Um, what I am interested in is uh, who is here today? Why are you all here? Who here is already some form of community manager, community leader, uh, in charge of a working group or a special interest group or something like that? Put your hands up if you're doing any kind of sort of deciding of things. Okay, okay. Who wants to be doing that work? <laughs> all right, that's a few more hands. I, I reckon between the two, I've got over half the room there. So welcome, you're in the right place. Everybody else, I hope you learned something anyway. Um, here's my take. I've been doing this a long time. And one of the things that I have observed is that we don't often take a look at the literature of communities and groups. Okay? As community people, I've been hanging around with other community architects and community gardeners, community maintainers, community leaders for, for a decade. And I very rarely see people say, hey, I read this really interesting paper, and I think it's got some implications. Right? We just don't do that. Um, some people do. It does happen a little bit, but it's not as prevalent as I would like. So what we instead end up with is a lot of situations where people will go and write an article or a book on, this is what worked for me. This is my anecdote of my community and how I built it. And that's great. We should have those things. Those things are lovely and interesting and useful to read. They give us ideas. But it's not consistent, right? And so I thought, well, let's have a look. And so I started digging into some of the literature, and I read some interesting books. And it started to dawn on me that there's a lot of useful stuff here, because it turns out that the main powerhouse of communities is people. And we've been studying people for over a century. And we have a lot of literature on psychology and sociology and economics, on motivation, on bond making, on how we build things and how we operate in things. And I don't see us talking about any of that very often. And I thought, that's a shame. We should do that. And so I decided that I would pitch a talk about it. And, and they accepted it, so thank you. Uh, so I, so my, my, my title is Build It and They Will Come, uh, which I think is a myth. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have encountered this phrase, right? Um, so I think that's one myth. I picked a few others. I had to give the other ones titles, because that's a really right, well-known phrase, right? The others don't have such a well-known phrase, but I made one up for each of them. Um, I've got the slides on a QR code at the end anyway, if you need it, so that's fine. Um, so I'm going to go through four examples. Now, there's tons we could talk about here. I could do this for like two hours. Um, but you'll get mad at me. So um, if you like this stuff, if you're interested in this, come and find me afterwards. Pick me up on Matrix. That's my uh, account there. And we'll chat some more. There's tons I don't have time to go into, whole areas that we're not going to talk about. So there's, there's lots we can do. But I picked four that I think are interesting. This is straight out of my uh, schedule notes to make sure I answer the questions I said I was going to. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk about each of these in turn. And I hope we'll have enough time to get through all of them. So. The first one is build it and they will come. Who's heard that phrase? All right, OK. Let me try and demonstrate the problem with build it and they will come. Someone give me a number. OK, that's about three seconds. Phil, give me a number. OK, about the same in this case. You broke my example. <laughs> Quite often when you do that, nobody will say anything for a bit. Everyone waits for somebody else to say it, right? And that is the key problem here. Um, build it and they will come doesn't really work because a lot of the time, Everyone thinks somebody else is going to do it. Uh, Douglas Adams famously put this as the somebody else's problem field. Right? It's that if you, don't, if you don't do it, somebody else will get to it. And it turns out we've been studying this for a while. So you think about, if, if I give you a specific example, I want to get something done in my project, something not glamorous. right? I want someone to go and update the documentation or do some packaging or fix some GitHub reviews or something like that. right? How am I going to get that done? Now, typically, you might. Put it in the newsletter, put a call out on the forum, pin an issue to the top of GitHub. You're making an appeal to the room at large, right? Uh, how often does that actually work? Exactly. I see some people waving their hands here doing this kind of thing. Not often, right? Build it and they will come happens by accident sometimes, but it's not consistent. And I would argue the best communities are not accidental, right? They are planned carefully. And so that doesn't really work. And it turns out we studied this. So in this paper here, oh, it's overlapping. That's what I get for doing my presentation development on a large monitor. Um, so in 2000, uh, Marky in 2000 did a study uh, where they went and did exactly this. They went into a chat room and started asking for help. And they did some rooms they would ask the room in general. And in some rooms, they would name specific people. Now, 
I have a problem with this paper, which is says the response time is in seconds, and I don't believe that. <laughs> I, think it might be, I think it might be in minutes, actually. Um, but nonetheless, you can see immediately that we've got two things going on here. Firstly, it scales much better if you ask people. Now, there are consequences to asking people that we're not going to go into today. You can ask me about that later. Um, but nonetheless, in terms of you getting your help or you getting your thing done, asking specific people works much better, right? But interestingly, as we just demonstrated, actually, sometimes when you ask the room at large, you do get a faster response in small rooms. What's interesting to me, and this is where I come back to this idea that we've been studying this for a long time, um, is that we've actually known this for a lot longer. This is a paper from 1968 in which we studied response times uh, when people ask for help at an accident. So you, you have an accident. You are doing CPR on somebody. You say, somebody call an ambulance. Turns out, this is the exact same problem. How likely someone is to call an ambulance gets worse the larger the number of bystanders. <laughs> and so you're much better to go, you, call an ambulance. And that works, right? So what, and, and there's other studies of this. Um, so Green and Gerber in 2008 did a, a research paper on the get out the vote campaigns and found that it is much better to do door-to-door -door knocking and asking people to vote that way than to send out flyers. Flyers are immensely cheaper but it still ends up more cost-effective to send people door-to-door -door knocking because it's vastly more effective. Right? You're appealing to individual people. And in fact, Latane, who wrote this paper, did another paper in 1981 talking about a model of persuasion. And the important thing they noted was that the, your, the persuasiveness of your argument decreases with the number of people you're trying to persuade. And so that's the same idea. Now, these examples are in small rooms. You know, you're not going to have 400 people as bystanders at an accident. But we work in rooms of hundreds of people. So if that model holds, and I would argue it's probably not linear, but if that model even slightly holds, that means by the time you get to 400 people, um, it's not likely to get much of a response if you just say, help. Right? So what's the implication for our community here? You want to target people, just as we did in this example where I said, give me a number. You need to target people. You need to say, who can do this for me? Go and talk to them. Right? Or it might be a small group. But don't do an appeal to the room at large if you, can't, if you don't have a better way. I mean, do it because it can't hurt. But don't expect a lot from it, right? Because you're not likely to get much. You're much better to say, who can do this? Now, you have to target it well. You have to say, who's the right person? Don't give a menial task to a significantly senior contributor. They may find it offensive. And don't give a supremely technical thing to someone who's just joined, right? They won't be able to do it. But find the right people. Who can do this for me? Let me go and talk to you directly. It's going to get you a much better result in the long term. And that's on us as leaders, right? It's on us to know who those people are. And we don't, I haven't time today to go into the whole sort of community data side of things, talk to the chaos people. Um, there's a whole section of people working on community statistics, um, which is super fascinating. Use it, right? Know who your key contributors are, yes, but also know who the next set of contributors are, who will be key next month, next quarter. Talk to them, because they're the people you can bump up into your significant contributors if you give them something useful to do. Right? So build it and they will come. No, be deliberate. Find some people to build it for you, and that will work much better. OK, time is already running away from me. Let's do number two. People contribute according to their time, skill, and alignment to the project. Yes, but also no. There's one other thing here. And to this, for this, I have to introduce a concept to you that I absolutely <laughs> love. I came across this. And I think it's really significant. It's the idea of social proof. The people follow the lead of similar other people. Let me give you an example. We're here on a conference, and I'm guessing most of us are staying in hotels. <coughs> so you will have seen in your hotels probably a sign saying, please reuse your towels. Right? It's good for the environment. Yeah? Familiar? Turns out if you do that, about 75% of people will reuse their towels. But critically, if the sign says, the person who last stayed in your room reuse their towels, it goes up to well over 90%. <clears throat> so it turns out people like to do the things that they observe other people doing. Or to turn it on its head, nobody wants to be the only one doing something. right? You don't want to be the first. So you can, you can reverse it around and say, oh, oh. You, you, it, it's also, we call it the network effect. No one wants to be the first one to jump off Facebook. right? They don't want to leave their friends behind. No one wants to be the first one to comment on a discussion piece in case they're the only ones that comment on the discussion piece. It's not an, it's not, I should be clear here, this is not a conscious decision. It's not you saying I'm not going to. But I think all of us, as a collective group of humans, tend to have this slightly subconscious worry that we might be the only one. Because we're social animals, right? So the problem here is that this gets everywhere in community. 
And so, the, so what you need to think about is, how do I make it so that I can show, other, show people that what I want doing is already being done? So take the example of uh, trying to get people to contribute to a discussion. It's quite handy to go to some of your key contributors behind the scenes and say, hey, could you go and comment on that thing so that I've got like three or four responses right now, and then other people will start joining in because there's actually a discussion happening. Right? You're short-circuiting that I don't want to be the first one because I might be the only one. Now, this has been studied quite a bit. Um, uh, so Cialdini wrote a whole book on, on uh, persuasion, um, and he goes into it. I'm going to park social proof for a moment um, because I need to fold it into something else. <laughs> so let, let me talk about goals for a second as well, um, and then we'll bring these two things together. So we also know that goals works really well. So again, trying to get people to do things, trying to encourage motivation, trying to get work done, that's the myth we're talking about. Um, now, I'm guessing most of us in our companies have been asked to set goals. Uh, I don't particularly enjoy it, but um, the fact is that we know this works, right? En masse, as a group, humans are quite well predictable. Individually, we're not. We don't like to be told what to do. But as a mass, we're pretty predictable. And it turns out goals works really well, and it works really well in communities. So here's an example from a review site. This was a, this was a community that was doing movie reviews, and they decided to do a little test. So they sent out an email to everybody, and they picked some different groups. So they said, for the next week, we're going to, we're going to do a push. We're going to try and do as many reviews as we can this week. And so some of them would have got an email saying, do as many as you can. Others got a specific target. So eight reviews, 16, 32, 64 reviews in the week. Now, in a week, 64 movie reviews is not realistic, right? It's not going to happen. But what's really interesting is that the do your best one is worst, and that even the completely unrealistic one is, significant, is basically as good as the next two down. So the takeaway for this is, yeah, have a roadmap. Have a goal. Set a deadline on it. I know in open source we tend to be, it'll be ready when it's ready. Right? It will be done when it's done. It's as long as a piece of string. No, we don't know what features are going to be in the next release. Fine. Not optimal, it turns out. Doesn't matter if you miss it. Doesn't matter if it's unrealistic. It's still OK, because you'll get more work done by setting the goal in the first place. Right? And that's really interesting. Now, that's a kind of a stretch to put that on a roadmap. But let's think about something like a hackathon, right? or a bug squash day, or a test day, or something like that. How would you structure that? knowing these things, well, I would say there's a couple of things you can do. Um, oh, sorry, I should also mention the, 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 uh, the motivation uh, frequent feedback. So this was a paper uh, that was done, and it said um, that you need that feedback. So think about your fundraisers. Think about the tele telethons and things where you say, hey, we've already raised $100,000. Can you make it $200,000? Right? There is always like a thermometer or a progress bar or something. Do we do that in open source? No. <laughs> Why not? It works. Why don't we not do that? Um, so it matters, right? And also notice, going back to the social proof thing, those bars never start at zero. You never turn on the TV to a telethon saying, we've raised zero dollars. <laughs> Will you be the first person to put money in the pot? No, of course you're not going to. Nobody else might. <laughs> you're going to be the only contributor. It's not going to happen, right? So no, they start, I mean, political parties start their membership numbers at 100,000, right? Because they don't want you to be the first one. So what does that mean when we're structuring our things? Well, think about that bug scrub day have a predefined goal for the project as a whole, but also for individual members, right? That's, that's the two things combined. And I'm not saying lie. I'm not saying make things up. Look at your data. How many bugs did you do in the last month? We did 50 in the last month. Can we do 200 this week? That's a cool goal, right? Set it. Say it. <laughs> and then put a progress bar somewhere so you can say, like, have a bot announcing when things get merged into the chat room, whatever. Show people that work is happening because then they will also want to contribute, right? But we don't do it. Um, have, have a goal for the members as well. Hey, welcome to the Bug Scrub Day. Can you get 20 things done? Here's the list, right? I mean, we haven't even talked about how you set those things up, but have a list of easy issues, right? It's a good way to get people started. And finally, I think going back to that social proof thing, have some people lined up to join your Bug Scrub Day before you announce it, right? Go to your senior contributors. We're going to set this thing up. Are you going to join? Please join. We need to make sure that it's got some presence. And that's your social proof combined with your goal setting. It's going to make those kind of things much, much more effective than just announcing it on social media and seeing what happens, right? What I love about this, this one I think is fairly, um, th these last two examples I think are fairly uh, self-evident, right? I think they're things we already know, but I think it's interesting to see that there's research that supports it, right? So the next one I'm going to show you is the opposite to that, which is why I find it the most interesting of these four, because it's completely counterintuitive. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's talk about this one. Moderation. 
Enforcing conduct, how do we do that in our communities? I have got this wrong. In my communities, I have done this wrong. And now that I know what I'm going to show you, I am very sad about it. So my instinct was, if I have a behavior and it is prevalent and I want to do something about it, I should make a big noise about it. Who would agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nodding. I've just told you that it's not true, right? So I don't blame you for not putting your hand up. <laughs> um, but, but no, it's not. Let me explain. Firstly, let me defend a code of conduct. And we know from, uh, from studying law and justice uh, that people feel that they will be treated better. They are more happy to obey the letter of the law if they know that it's fair and it's well spelled out and they can understand it. So have your codes of conduct. I know they're not a great fan for everybody, and I'm not going to endorse a particular one, but have something, right? Say how your community is run, because then when you need it, it is there and it is applied fairly to everyone, right? That is important. Um, you will have less drama in your communities if it is clear and fair, right? If you can go further, there's further evidence. I haven't put it on here, but if you can involve people in the writing of those things, that's even better. If they have, uh, if they have uh, a say in it, then they're even more likely to, 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 to stick to it. But for the people that are not sticking to it, or for other behaviors you want to deal with, I need to introduce you to the idea of norms. And in particular, the psychologists have different norms. I'm talking about descriptive norms. This is what we learn from observing others. And so we come into a community. Uh, who, may, who has joined a chat room and waited two days before they've said anything? Descriptive norms. Right? You're learning how the community operates. You're learning what behavior is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And, hmm? Lurk more. Lurk more, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, this is why I, I like systems that have proper history in their rooms uh, rather than joining and seeing a blank screen, right? Because then you have to wait longer to figure out what the norms are. Um, and I'm sorry about the overlapping. Uh, oh, that's about to happen. <laughs> so, um, sorry, I'm looking at my speaker notes, right? Um, so... The problem with norms is that they've got, they work both ways. Norms are just a thing you've seen happening in the community. It doesn't mean it's a thing you want in your community as a leader, right? And so the problem is if you make a big deal about something that is very common, you run the risk of enforcing the fact that everybody does it. I will give you an example. I come from the UK, and in the UK it is very common for people to drive a little bit above the speed limit on the motorways maybe so 10% or so above the speed limit, right? And if you go and arrest everybody doing it, you're just enforcing that everybody does it. So they don't, right? Nobody makes a fuss about it. They, should they? That's a different debate. But they don't, because you're just going to draw attention to it, right? And this has been studied, it turns out. Um, so there was a, there's quite a few different pieces of research on this one. I've picked just one. The study goes like this. We're looking at littering, OK? It's a, it's a behavior you don't want, but it is quite common in some areas. And so they did an experiment. They took two different areas. One is very nice and clean, nice gardens, parks. One is a similar kind of area, but very messy. It's full of litter, right? So it's still a nice nature area, but it's full of litter. And then, first of all, they observe how people behave. So we've got a baseline. And then they paid actors to walk through this space littering. And in the clean area, what they saw was that the amount of littering that went on for the people who were not paid to do it um, went down. So having seen people littering, you're drawing attention to the fact that it's a nice place and therefore people do littering less. That's the implication. In the messy area, however, it went up. <laughs> it actually made people litter more because they observed people doing a thing. The area is clearly messy. Clearly nobody cares about it. It's the broken window theory, if you've heard of that as well, right? If, when you have something that's very common, if you draw attention to it, it makes it even more common. So this is the thing I've got wrong. It is very much my, most originally my position that if you want to deal with something, you have to make a big deal about it. But it turns out the answer is no. If you have something that is very common, do it quietly, right? Speak to the person, take it behind the scenes, get rid of it if you can. Point out the code of conduct, we'll come to that. But if it's a new behavior, if it's not yet an established norm, that's when you go in hard. That's when you make a big deal. That's when you reply on the forum going, we don't do that here, right? Because then you stop it before it becomes a norm, and you draw attention to the other norm, which is all the other people not doing it. So this is all very kind of subtle and subconscious stuff, but you're drawing attention to that. For, and remember, when, as leaders, when we reply to things on mailing lists and chat, we're not just replying to the person, right? We're replying to the room at large. And that is something we have to keep in mind. And so again, we're drawing attention to these norms. So that's Cialdini again. Um, but there's one more point to this, and I come back to code of conduct here. This is a quote from um, Gregory Jackson, I think, from MIT. Um, in 1994, and this was when he gave the quote, not when the work was happening, right? So this goes back a long way. At MIT, they had a policy that said, if they saw somebody doing something they shouldn't, 
they would send an email and it would say, somebody has been using your account. And if that wasn't you, you should come talk to us and we'll reset your password. And if it was you, please don't do it again. Right? And I've, I've spoken to some friends in the US who say this happens a lot with illegal downloading as well. Uh, they get these kind of messages. But the point here is that two interesting things happened. One, people they knew from eyewitness accounts that had definitely done the thing came and reset their password. <laughs> Two, virtually nobody ever reoffended after getting one of these messages. And so I'm not going to stand here and say that if someone has done a seriously bad thing in your community, you shouldn't take action. Of course you should. But in that misdemeanor area, in that first infraction, in that message that was slightly off color, maybe do this. Maybe give them a chance. So this is where your code of conduct comes back in. This is why I say you should have the code of conduct, but put it on page two. Have a look at the Django community, for example, and there are others as well. I love Django's example. They have an incredibly detailed code of conduct. They have an enforcement policy, a reporting policy. You know exactly what the rules are and how you can report it and what will happen if you do. It's fabulously detailed. It's also completely hidden away behind a tiny link in the footer. And so, and so what that means is the first time somebody breaks the rules, they can say, well, you might not have seen this, but don't do that. And it's basically this. It's basically this example from MIT of giving people that one chance out and if they do it again, fine, right? But giving that people that one chance can be really important because if you don't, if you do what I would have done before I learned all this stuff, and you go in hard and you say, let's really, really tackle this thing, what can happen is these people double down. They say, no, I'm allowed to do this. And they might well be right. <laughs> um, but then they're forced to do it again just to prove they were right the first time. And you get into this confrontation. <clears throat> Whereas we know from these kind of studies that if you give people a chance to say, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realize, but you do that quietly, it doesn't happen again. So this is one I definitely got wrong in the past. Be aware of the prevalence of behavior before you go out there and decide what to do about it. And that, I think, is quite counterintuitive. It is very, there's other examples for people stealing things from national parks, for example. I like that one. So they did a sign saying, don't steal things from national parks. It's terrible. It's going to break the national park. And what happened? More stuff got taken. <laughs> <laughs> When they said, yeah, like they had two signs, and one was just like a careful kind of, the parks are nice, please keep them nice. And then the other one was this super high, like, people keep taking stuff, stop doing it. This one works better. <laughs> so it's not just this littering example. There's, there's plenty of evidence that this is absolutely true and that drawing attention to norms is an important thing to think about. OK, um, how am I doing for time? I've got seven minutes. Uh, let's do the last one. Lowering barriers to entry is critical to success. Who thinks that's a good idea? Absolutely, I can't go high enough. However, however, I promised you an example where it's not about right or wrong, it's not about do this, don't do that, but rather there are consequences to choices and you have a choice, right? So what am I really talking about here? I'm talking about the kind of things that I tend to see in GitHub messages. I don't like these things. <laughs> these are messages I do not like, right? I do not want to see people being nasty to other people, but it does happen. And there are slightly more sane, more... Um, neutral versions of this that express the same idea that you must be at a certain level to join this community. Right? I'm thinking of one community in particular, <laughs> which I'm sure we can all think of, um, but there's quite a lot of this that goes on in our world and it goes on in other worlds as well. Um, it doesn't just have to go on in terms of being um, nasty about people's uh, background. You can set initiation rituals uh, just because you want people to go through them. Think about your frat houses um, or your cults. Uh, think about um, anything where you've got to go through something to get in, right? And even, even neutral things like do a certain amount of work before you get your wings, right? So there's been experiments done on communities where you had to tag a certain number of items before you got a proper account, for example. And there was a good experiment done with that, actually. So these things create barrier to entry. I would argue I don't like barrier to entry. I want lots of people in my community, right? However, because I'm not biased and I'm presenting research, not my own opinions. <laughs> it turns out these things can have a purpose. Let me first of all talk about cognitive dissonance. Um, I bring this up, it's, it's kind of tangential to this point, but I want people to be aware of it. It's the idea that, why, why do we think these things, why do some people think these things are good? Why do we have our parents going, well, my education never did me any harm? Um, it's because we went through a thing. Right? We joined this group, we did the work, we put up with the bad behavior, we did the horrible thing we had to do to join. That wasn't fun, it wasn't nice, but we did it anyway. Now, we are rational human beings, right? We're rational human beings, and so we must be making good choices, right? And so therefore, the only reason we did that horrible thing was so that I joined something of value. 
right? And so it turns out that if you have two very similar groups and one has some kind of initiation ritual and one does not, the people joining the one that's got the ritual have a higher value of that group for no other reason, once you've dealt with all the other factors, than because they had to go through the horrible thing to join. And that's cognitive dissonance. That's you realigning things to make it work so that you can be happy about yourself as a rational person. And because if, if, it, if the group's not worth anything, then why did you do the horrible thing, right? That's the bottom line. We can't be rational people if we're doing things like that. <laughs> So that's cognitive dissonance in this context, right? And, and it's a whole interesting theory. I recommend reading more on it. Um, and so this is, this is the take on it uh, that I've just explained, right? So you know, people, people like things they suffered for because otherwise they're not an intelligent person. Right? What does that mean for us as community people? Well, it turns out that yes, you will get less people joining your community if you put barriers to entry. But the people who do join are more committed. And that's the bottom line, right? Um, so there's research done on this. I mentioned uh, tagging items. There was a study done where they asked people to tag different numbers of items depending on you know, random factors. Basically, they put people in cohorts. You have to do nothing. You get your account right away. You have to do five items. You have to do 10. You have to do 25. People who had to do 25 items was a much smaller group, but they came back significantly more times to the website. Um, and so it does make a difference. So the point here, the point that I want to make is that you have a choice in this situation. There is no right or wrong, but you have to decide what kind of community you're trying to build, right? Do you want a small committed contributor base or do you want a wide access group that's got lots of less committed people? That's up to you. I can't tell you the right answer. What I can tell you is that we know that that's a choice, right? It's, you can't have both. Um, I tend to lean on this side, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so there's that. Um, and so that's me, actually. I've gone a little ahead of time. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. <laughs> Um, I, I'm sorry, I do, I, there's a whole area, there's tons of stuff we haven't talked about. I could talk to you about motivation and reward systems and, and how that's important. I could talk to you about bond building in community and how we get to know people in community and why that's important for commitment. There's two types of bonds, so you have to watch out for that because there's a bond to the project and then there's a bond to the people. And if some of the people leave and you've bonded with the people, then you're going to go too, right? So, but, but if the project's losing its way, but you've still got friends there, you might stick around, right? So. Tons of stuff there. We could talk about communication methods. There's a whole other section on newcomers. I mean, newcomers, right? They don't know what they're doing. They are generally clueless. They have no idea how to talk to anybody else. They keep breaking stuff, and yet they are super critical to your project. So, you know, there's a whole chapter there on how, how we deal with newcomers. Tons of stuff. There's tons of stuff here we could talk about. So I've put a couple of reading materials up. Most of the examples I put in this talk came from the first one, Building Successful Online Communities. That is a literature review uh, over lots of things like this and more. Um, super good read, super dense. <laughs> it took me a while to read it, um, but it's really, really good. Social Architecture by Peter Hinchins. Peter Hinchins was a genius, frankly, sorely missed. Um, but uh, it's a good read. Uh, he, he built the ZeroMQ community, um, and he tends on the extreme side with some of his opinions. But there's a lot of really good material in there. And uh, there's a paper there, Baldwin and Clark, um, which is all about modularity and why you should have plugins and things rather than building monoliths. Uh, which is really, really interesting as well. I could put a whole pile more, but they don't fit on the slide. Um, so you could look at um, Art of Community by Jonah Bacon. You could look at um, the space paper from GitHub a couple of years ago. Uh, there's, there's tons of entry points into this. Come find me afterwards. Um, and I think that gives us a few time for questions. These are, the, these are the QR codes. Slides on the left, my matrix ID on the right. If you want to chat with me, please do. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs> I hope, I hope it was useful to you. <laughs> Questions? Oh, Alexi? So cold calls are better than spamming. That's an interesting way of putting it. Um, yes, with caveats. Yes, with caveats. I wouldn't call it cold calling, because I'm not talking to people I don't know. Right? In theory, I should already know these names. And they have some idea of who I am as the project leader. right? Um, and so what I'm looking at is I'm saying, well, these are my top 10 contributors. And I'm not going to give them more work. <laughs> but I do know who the next 10 top contributors are. Who's in the 11 to 20 bracket? And can I talk to some of them? Who are they? Have I spoken to them yet? Maybe I should ping them on chat and just say, hey, how are you doing? Um, so it's, it's kind of cold calling, but not entirely, I would say. Because it should be people who are familiar with you. You at least know the username. Um, you know roughly what they're interested in in the project. You, you know where in the project they're contributing. 
Um, you've got a little bit of an idea of who they are, right? So they've kind of opted in, exactly. And, and, and certainly, they should know who you are. So when you message them and say, hey, can we chat, that's not a cold call, right? Um, it's, but, but you're not wrong. It's still better than spamming, yes. <laughs> wow, I've stunned everybody into silence. <laughs> oh, well, nobody else has got their hand up, Alexi. <laughs> No, norms are a huge thing, right? We could, we could talk about norms all day. It's like, yeah, I love this. <laughs> now, no, norms in general, I think, are uh, a really interesting topic. And there's different types of norms as well. Yeah, but, but the, the point is, uh, the, sorry, the thing of not going personal when when it starts an issue, and uh, not tracking the connection back to the end user. Uh, Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going to repeat because I know that you won't get picked up on the microphone. So we're talking about um, not, the, the not drawing attention to things. Yeah, it is really effective. Um, and it's, 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 there are a few more examples of this out there that I can find for you. But it, I love these ones that are counterintuitive because I think as, as community leaders, as community managers, it pays us to know those ones particularly because they are pitfalls we will get into. Right? Um, a lot of the stuff that I have learned over the last couple of years as I started reading more of this is things that I already knew, but, I did, but now I know why. Right? And that's really useful, because then that leads you to think about Social proof, for example, gets everywhere. Like the minute you start thinking about, how do I make sure that this is already running? Like I come, people come to me and say, why am I getting tumbleweed on my discussions? I'm like, well, <laughs> that's social proof, I'm afraid. Like you've got an empty discussion. It's a topic nobody knows much about. You are going to have to go and find some people to go and comment on it for you. Because that's how you short circuit it. It's how you get rid of the social proof problem. Right? It's this constant idea that we have to show people that other people like them. The like them is critical here. That's how social proof works. But other people like them, which in the community is most of the people, right? Because all, you've all got this common goal. Uh, and therefore, most people, at least within the context of the project, are like you. Um, that whole area then is about getting that short circuited, getting that pushed through, and saying, get something started, because then other people will start joining in. All right, we've got time for one more question, if anyone has. All right, well, in that case, oh, oh, yes, go on. Do you believe that all programs are current, or, or do our global outputs are going up with all the culture of Are the things I've learned globally applicable to, uh, to these <laughs> systems? I think it's. I think it's wider than just engineering communities. Um, so so the, the book I mentioned, um, Building successful online communities is all types of online communities, right? So it talks about review sites, it talks about World of Warcraft, it talks about Facebook, but when it was like 500,000 users, because this book was written in 2012. <laughs> but it, it does take in a lot more things. And I think because you can take some of this research back to pre-internet times, I think it's just about group dynamics, right? And where you find those older results, they'll apply anywhere, right? But caveat that, people are funny. <laughs> and the smaller the group, the more likely you are to get something that doesn't match the behavior, right? So you've got five people, all bets are off. <laughs> but the minute you're up to a couple of hundred people in the peripheries, right? You might only have 10 really core contributors, but the minute you've got a decent sized project going on, all of this stuff's going to start to apply, right? Um, and if I can pitch this last thing, because I know I've just hit the time. Um, this is, for example, why I think uh, discourse is so popular in our open source communities right now, because actually once you start looking at this, and then you start looking at what the things discourse does, it does it really well. It does it really, really well. There are so many tiny things within discourse. Clearly discourse, not discord. Um, that, 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 um, that it does fantastically well. So to your point about mailing lists, let's see, uh, mailing lists are dead. <laughs> um, or rather they're not, but they mean something else to the next generation of developers, because it, it, it means spamming. OK, uh, we're out of time. Thank you very much, folks. Find me at the Ansible stand. <laughs>